Good morning, Restore Community Church. It is my pleasure to be with you again. Here we are talking about messy church once again. And today we're going to be talking about the idea of some, uh, of idols and Christian liberty. That, that here we are, maybe you're watching this today. This is your first interaction with something with church. We're here to talk about Christian liberty of what, what can we do? What can't we do? Where's the line? Uh, and sometimes the the line blurs and sometimes we move the line. Um, but the passage where we're going to be referring to today mainly is 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verses 1 through 13 and then chapter 10 verses 23 through 33. So I'm going to read this block of text so I can point back to it. I can refer back to it. Um, so if you want to pull out your Bibles to read along, uh, it might even show up here on the screen. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 13, in 10, 23 through 33. Now, concerning food sacrifice to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. I just want to underline that right there. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there have been so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom all for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, these weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is the cause of their falling, I will never eat meat, so that I may not cause one of them to fall. All things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Do not seek your own advantage, but that of others. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience, for the earth and its fullness are the Lord's. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat out of consideration for the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I mean the other's conscience, not your own. For why should my liberty be subject to the judgment of someone else's conscience? If I partake in thankfulness, why should I be denounced because of that for which I give thanks? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, so that they may be saved. Woo! 
that that was a that was a chunky text. I, I'm I'm glad you're still with me. There's a lot going on here as we we break it down. Uh, but this idea of liberty, of freedom, that yes, we are in Christ free. That freedom is in Christ is one of the most profound gifts that we find in the gospel. That offering believers a life no longer bound by the constraints of the law bound by sin but guided by grace and guided by love yet it's a, this freedom that comes with a challenge of navigating the the cultural norms of the time these, these personal convictions and responsibilities to honor god in every decision we make the, the Apostle Paul is saying here in his letter to the Corinthians, he's addressing a key controversy of the time, and that's whether Christians could eat meat that had been sacrificed in a temple to an idol. That while the, the issue may seem very distant, we, we, you, you don't really have the option to go to a temple out on the street uh, and buy some meat that was purchased to the god Mithras or the, the god Ra or the god... That's not really, it doesn't seem the same for us. It doesn't seem like a one-to-one, -one, but it. I think it reveals a timeless principle for understanding of Christian liberty that echoes on into to today. That God used Paul to speak to the church of Corinth just as he using, he's used Paul to speak to the church today. And that is the role of, of conscience, a word that popped up a lot in that, that block of text, conscience, and the importance of considering others in our own choices. And to, to somewhat understand the, the depth of this debate, the depth of what's going on here, it, the, the historical backdrop of this is for centuries, the Jews were under strict dietary laws that Leviticus 11 outlined a bunch of these restrictions saying you may eat any animal that has a split hoof completely divided and that chews cud. That this, this it seems like a simple rule, a strange rule, but it's simple. It, it excluded many animals like the camel, like rabbits, like pigs. That, that these animals are unclean. If you had eaten them, you would be considered unclean and outside of the promise of God until you could be made clean again through sacrifice. And the, these Israelites were from, forbidden from even touching the carcass of one of these animals. If, you're, if your camel is going down the road and you're a merchant going from city to city, you bring in your goods and your camel dies, you can't even touch the carcass of that camel in, in this Levitical law here. So the idea of even permissible meats were subject to specific methods of preparation, like cows, you could only eat certain way, chicken the same, uh, that while meat could be boiled, it could be roasted, it could be cooked in a stew. I feel like that's the beginning of a very popular hobbit quote about potatoes uh here at the meat there's strict prohibition against boiling a young goat and its mother's milk we find this in exodus 23 as well as in deuteronomy 14 and this law extended over a time to a broader prohibition against consuming meat and dairy together and that this was a a, a a law that was strictly against a pagan ritual at the time to where as a sacrifice for good luck and fertility, you would sacrifice a kid and drink the mother's goat at the same time. So now in this time of first Corinthians, Paul is, is in the early church are facing a new dynamic. That with the gospel spreading to, to the Greeks, to the Gentiles outside of the Hebrew faith, questions are, are being raised about how strict can non-Jews adhere to these Jewish customs. I wasn't, I wasn't raised in that belief, guys. I, I've, I've always bought my meat from this temple. Did Gen and the question was, did Gentiles need to follow the same dietary laws? undergo circumcision, keep other aspects of Mosaic and Levitical law? 
Uh, in Acts 15, the Jerusalem Council addressed many of these debates, offering guidance that Gentiles should abstain from food, sacrifice to idols, from blood, from sexual immorality. Yet the practical application, there's some tussle, there's some, some challenge there, especially in a place like Corinth, where idol worship and guild feast, which is your local guild, your craftsman guild, that you... Basically, if you wanted a job you needed to be a part of, would often act, give sacrifice to the guild's idol and then share a feast over that. So a guild feast, they were everywhere in Corinth. And these guild feasts, they were so integral to Roman culture that they're, it just everyone did it. Every guild had this. And any leftover meat was sold at a discount at the marketplace the next day leading to this ethical dilemma in, in followers of the way, followers of Christ there in Corinth, was it even permissible to eat meat, to buy that meat in the market the next day that was associated with idol worship the night before? And so it's Paul's response and God's response to this controversy in, in 1 Corinthians 8 and chapter 10 reveals a profound understanding and expose on Christian liberty. On the one hand, he acknowledges that idols, they have no real power. And therefore, eating meat sacrificed to an idol isn't inherently sinful. There's no power there. There's no real idol. So the meat isn't tainted. But on the other hand, he emphasizes that not all believers understand this. Not all believers believe that, that they don't possess the knowledge, as he says, and some might view eating such meat as an act of idol worship in and of itself. I, I, I have a friend at a, a previous job I worked at that he refused to eat meat that was labeled halal because he felt like, oh, that was meat sanctified for the eating of Muslims, um, and so he just wouldn't. And, and I can't help but think of him here in this moment. And so this tension between personal freedom and communal responsibility can extends to today. Questions about entertainment choices. What, what, what do you watch on TV? What are you listening to? What books do you read? How do we balance the freedom that we have in Christ? with the call to love and serve others. And in addressing these issues in Corinthians, Paul is offering, God is offering these principles to us today. That freedom is always guided by love. The bumpers there, uh, uh, if you think of a bowling alley, there's bumpers there. Love keeps us from missing the pins entirely. That freedom must be guided by love. That not all freedom is beneficial. And everything we should do should glorify God. So let's, let's, let's kind of get into it. Um, as every sermon does, it feels like they have three points. And so I'm just going to follow the, the tried and true method. And so my point one is freedom must be guided by love. That Paul, when, in the block of text that I asked us to underline, he contrasts the difference between knowledge and love. That knowledge puffs up, but love builds. That while the idols are meaningless to the mature believer, not everyone shares this understanding and exercising a freedom without considering your brother or your sister's understanding can can lead them astray that knowledge puffs up oh people that boast that puffs up it's a pride thing that boasts about knowing god oh yeah do i have a relationship with god have you seen my diplomas I, i've got a master's in divinity i've got a master's in biblical study that's knowledge where somebody who loves god would then explain oh, do i love do I know God? Do I follow Jesus? Let me tell you the moments where Jesus has been in my life. Let me show you the moments where Jesus has loved me. 
that knowledge puffs up, but love builds. So like it says in verse 9 that we need to be careful that to exercise your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. Just because we we know better. And so the idea of drinking alcohol in in front of somebody recovering from addiction, you have the, the, the Christian liberty to drink alcohol. But how does that affect your brother next to you? How does that affect your brother your sister next to you, who may be struggling, but you have the freedom, the knowledge, but love would cause us to set it down, to not even order it, to say no thanks, because we want to build up the people around us and that which they struggle with to a place where they can enjoy the same freedom as you in a way that you don't know. I, I I use myself as an example. When I was a teenager, before I even met Christ, I was an alcoholic. Yes, as a teenager, I was an alcoholic. And when I was rescued by Christ, I gave all that up. That, that, that alcoholism is a a part of the old Dustin, and I'm now a new creation in Christ. I've left that to the side because I know what it's like to struggle in that. And I wouldn't want to cause anybody to stumble just because I want to go back and have a taste. I miss the taste. I miss the the way it makes me feel. I miss anything about it. I could never go back because I know what it was like to struggle through that. And so for my second point, not all freedom is beneficial. Paul, he reframes liberty saying, he even says, I have the right to do anything. Under the umbrella and blood of Jesus Christ, the freedom from sin that I have, I have the right to do anything. But not everything is beneficial or constructive. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. That true freedom in Christ, it's not about indulgence but about discerning what glorifies God and benefits others. So the idea here, and it kind of goes along with my point three, and it's doing everything for the glory of God. Paul concludes the talk in uh, in chapter 10, verses 31 through 33, saying, So whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. You got the freedom. But is that freedom beneficial to the king? Does that freedom glorify the Lord? I I always say it. It's like a loving relationship. Marriage is a reflection of what our relationship should be like with Christ. And so in, in maybe your relationships that you have, there are things you could do anything in a relationship. But does it glorify them? I could decide to never do another dish again in the sink. My life would be so much easier. But does that glorify my wife by making her do that chore when I should be doing that chore? That those are my dirty dishes as well? No, to, to edify and to be beneficial to my home, I, I do the dishes. And so the same thing with us. We may have the liberty to do all things. We may have the liberty to watch all things, to listen to all things, to to read all sorts of books, to listen to all sorts of podcasts and influences. But are those influences, are these things beneficial to the kingdom, beneficial to the Lord? And so I want us to take a moment and invite God into our lives. That might sound like a strange thing, but sometimes we're like, God, are we? I love you. I love going to Loughton. I love going to Woodford, to Albany. Those Walking into those buildings, I just feel your presence. But God, can you not walk into my living room? Can you not walk into to the room my TV's in? Can you not walk into my headphones? Because this place, I kind of want to... So let's invite Jesus into our lives, every aspect to it, 
and think, God, where, where do I have the liberty, but I'm misusing it? Where do I have the liberty where it's not beneficial or glorifying to my brother or sister, or glorifying to the king? So let's close our eyes and pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word, how it speaks to us today. You're speaking to the city of Corinth and you're speaking to the city of London, 2024. That your word lives and breathes. And Father, as we rejoice in the freedom from sin that your blood and sacrifice bought for us those 2,000 years ago, Father, let us know that love is what should be guiding us. That our chains may be broken, but we still have brothers and sisters in bondage. Our chains may be broken, and we need to be guided by love to show others the way. So, Father, come into our rooms, into our homes, into our phones, wherever we get influence from, and have your way. For Jesus, we want to glorify you. For your kingdom, not our own. For your name, not our own. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Thank you so much for stopping by, guys. Please be sure to tune in next week as we're going to finish out this Messy Church series. Uh, It's been an eye-opener, if you will. I love seeing the parallels of back then and today that God, it does, the scripture is breathing today. It is true today as it was then. Uh, It's funny how God does that, how God's word can still reverberate even today. So so tune in next week as we're concluding our Messy Church series. Until then, I wish you a hearty, happy Thanksgiving coming up this Thursday. And until then, I'll see you next time, guys.